Welcome, welcome, welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the podcast that goes deeper into topics and segments that originally aired on The Daily Show. This, this, this is what you got to think of this podcast as. Like, if this was a wrestling match, The Daily Show was the regular main event and the cage and the, the folding chair and the table. This podcast is a flying elbow drop from Macho Man Randy Savage off the top rope to win the belt at WrestleMania 4. A great ending to a classic match. Oh, yeah. And today, I'm going to try and do Macho Man. We're going to be talking about wrestling, professional wrestling, sports entertainment, just in time for pro wrestling's biggest event, WrestleMania. Today, we're diving into how the worlds of wrestling and politics are more alike than they may appear, and wrestlers and politicians can learn a few things from one another about performance and building a connection with their audience. Now, Ronnie Chang, uh, Ronnie Chang, he did this topic on The Daily Show a couple of years back, he went down the middle of America in Iowa and flyover country, and he talked to a wrestler named the Progressive Liberal and crafted a unique villain persona by bringing politics into the squared circle. Uh-huh. Miss Elizabeth rolled the clip. Democrats might know how to rally their base, but when they reach out to middle America, they say things like... For working families to get a share of that prosperity that they're creating, we need some serious enforcement of competition laws. You're boring. And it's no surprise, last election, people in swing states went for a guy who said things like... Who's gonna pay for the wall? like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. Trump honed his trademark oratorical style. Where else? In professional wrestling. And if Democrats were going to fight back, they needed someone who could go head-to-head with a WWE Hall of Famer like Trump. And in the heart of cold country, we found him. Shut your ignorant mouth, because the progressive liberal has something to say. So you're on the wrong side of history. Shut up! But even if the crowd hates him, the progressive liberal could teach swing state Democrats some classic wrestling techniques for getting voters' attention. You want to stick to broad brushstroke talking points. Right. So middle America would rather learn about politics through a mostly naked man than by reading a book. Yeah. Later in this episode, we'll be joined by WWE superstar L.A. Knight, who'll break down the world of wrestling and how politicians can take a few pointers from the art of wrestling. But first, my guest, can I say friend? I feel like I feel like we've known each other long enough to friend this friend adjacent. With, with. I think we're absolutely, if not friend, friend adjacent. If I saw you in a fight, I'd at least break it up. I don't know if I would help. I need to know what you did first to get punched in the face. (laughs) He's a renowned radio DJ from the Michael K Show and Hot 97, who's also the host of the Cheap Heat podcast on the Ringer Wrestling Show from Spotify. And your forever 24-7 champion, Peter Rosenberg, welcome to Beyond the Scenes. Uh, I am honored to be a part of a podcast this professional really makes my jabroni podcast look like a joke your podcast is a good time man i've been on a couple of them now i I apologize in advance for not wearing a a shirt and tie for your podcast but (laughs) i'm trying to spiff you up my look i look weird without my blaze i look like a mcdonald's shift manager once you roll up (laughs) once you roll up your dress sleeves oh yeah no no you're a manager you're now it's no longer it's no longer correspondent you gotta drop some fries (laughs) <laughs> well said, well said. Drive through line around the building. <laughs> now, let's just start with your love for wrestling, bro. Like, what's the earliest wrestling match or moment that you remember, like, that got you hooked? You know, and what is it about professional wrestling that gets the fans so wrapped up in it? Like, I remember watching Monday Night Raw as a child. I'm 44, just for perspective. So, mm-hmm. I remember watching Monday Night Raw and seeing the Ultimate Warrior. Dude, I was watching wrestling on Saturday mornings, WCW. Yeah. I watched Glow. I did all of it. But just take me back to your origin story of falling in love with the square circle. So, yeah, my, my origin story is the same. I'm, about, I'm almost the same age as you. I'm 43, and it was Saturday mornings. I can't pinpoint exactly what it was, like what the feeling was, but I do remember what storyline it was and and the one that really truly hooked me was uh they were simultaneous they were the build to wrestlemania 3 it was hulk hogan and andre the giant and uh the aforementioned macho man randy savage and ricky the dragon steamboat and those two stories just drew me in man my my level of 
passion for Ricky the Steamboat, for Ricky the Dragon Steamboat getting his redemption on Macho Man after <laughs> Macho Man crushed his larynx with the with the bell. I I was just absolutely hooked from that point on. For me, it was Ultimate Warrior. That was my guy. And before I understood the intricacies of the human vascular system, and I did not know that you should not tie shoestrings, tourniquet levels tight on your arm, and then run around the house. Like, I saw Ultimate Warrior do the promos, like, load the spaceship with the rocket fuel, Hulk Hogan, you know, like all of that stuff, right? Yeah. I didn't know that when they yell cut, Ultimate Warrior would take that shit off his arm and get blood back to his fingers. I kept that shit on my arm for hours at a time, like hand noticeably numb. <laughs> and like, that was my thing, bro. My cousin Voren used to put us in the figure four leg locks. He would put us in the perfect plex. And the thing that I always loved about wrestling also was that, you know, to a weird degree from a, you know, it leaned into stereotypes in the eighties, but there was still some degree of representation. No matter who you were, you had a guy. It was at the height of the Cold War and they still had Nikolai Volkov stomping through that bitch, screaming Russia. You had the Iron Sheik to represent the whole Middle East. Like that part of it I really love. Now you come from a politically active family. Like does that help you understand wrestling in a unique way? Like to you, what are the similarities in this world? And you know, what percentage of wrestling fans do you think connect with politics on the same wavelength? You know, I never think about it being the same wavelength, but there's no way to to deny like some of the facts. You know, when you talk about wrestling, you, there's good guys and bad guys. Obviously, in the case of politics, your good guys and bad guys vary depending on your your view of the world. But there is always someone. I mean, when you think about it, and I know we'll dive more into Trump obviously later for his multiple layers with regard to this subject. But like when you think about it, for so many people. Uh, Trump is like this long-term bad guy who lasts. Like, it's almost like now if you were to talk, when you talk to progressives, it's almost like a, in a weird way they don't want Trump to go away because he is the guy to root against. And let's be honest, DeSantis yeah. is almost the same guy in so many ways, but he's not nearly as fun to root against. Like, he doesn't yeah. have a villain character tied up the way Donald Trump does for progressives. And so my biggest memory about politics and the intersection with politics and wrestling was when me and my, at the time, very young cousin, who was working on Capitol Hill in his early 20s, when him and I got into a loud, screaming match about how I believed pro wrestling was just as important as politics. <laughs> and mm. he did he did not appreciate it. Now, granted, I was trolling. I was trolling, and I, I as a wrestling fan, <laughs> often find myself, especially back then, more so than now, often found myself on the defensive. of Because they of call life. it fake, and they wouldn't yeah, acknowledge the physicality. And, yeah. and, and, and just sort of with, because of that, because the outcomes are predetermined, particularly, you know, not really not as much today, though it still happens, but really it used to be like, just such an easy way to put someone down was to attack the fact that wrestling was was predetermined, which of course has no effect on how I view the art. In fact, I prefer it. I like, and I, I heard recently it's Rick It's live Rubin drama. Yeah, I heard Rick It's Rubin no different drama. than your fucking TV show that you love and you tune in in prime time every week for. I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, I, no, no, I, I no, get no. riled up it, about it. It's, it's a stupid argument, and it's frustrating for anyone who's ever enjoyed wrestling. My thing always is, I, I've always wanted to do this. As a matter of fact, you have the platform to do it. You should. I've always wanted to walk into a movie theater, like wearing wrestling apparel, and when it gets to the good part of the movie, turn around and yell to everyone, you know this is fake, right? This is not a documentary. Nice. This is fake. It's like, nice. I don't understand. And I think it goes back to a time where people felt like they were ripped off and cheated. Like when the when people finally realized that this art form, which was clearly not real then, was in fact predetermined. I think many people mm -hmm. felt heartbroken and burned by it and angry at it as a result. And some of the, that is left over to this day. But yeah, the political part's always been, it's always been there and it, it's tied together in many different ways, whether directly or indirectly. But then to that point, I think that wrestling and politics do have that similarity because I think a lot of, I think a lot of voters possess the same level of disappointment when they think that their politician is uh, wait, no, you don't care about my issue, but I thought you cared about my issue. Why would you do that to me? That's not cool. 
and people are legitimately heartbroken. I think where wrestling and politics are also similar is that, to me, politics in America has changed from, I, I that guy is just like me. Like every politician ran on, I'm just like you. They show up to your town, they wear your stupid denim, whatever you wear when you go to work. They show up at your job wearing a stupid hard hat. They eat the shitty burger at the fair <laughs> to show you, look, I'm just like you. But somehow it is transformed into, I don't want to vote for the guy that's just like me. I want to vote for the guy I want to be. I wish I had his life. I wish I could be him. And every wrestler that we ever grew up, our favorite wrestlers were the ones we wanted to imitate. You wanted to be that person. I got four splinters in my hand trying to fucking be Hacksaw Jim Duggan because I didn't understand the concept of you don't grab just raw two by fours in a back alley. Like if that's pressed wood, bro, you're gonna catch a disease through your hand. Like what what wrestler do you think would make a great politician? And well, I know Trump would be a good wrestler. I mean, Trump has already wrestled, so that's already I mean, started. let's be honest. Physically, it was not the most impressive performance we've ever seen. Yes, he has been involved in a storyline. <laughs> uh, I dare you to go back Did and watch. Did you just shit on his whole fucking arc? <laughs> <laughs> I dare you to go back and watch uh, WrestleMania 23 when he has that match and he attacks Vince McMahon. I, you have never looked close. You have never seen a human being throw punches that look like this. Like he like hits sideways like a little kid beating up his brother. But um honestly, it's 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 so hard for me to think of because there's so many people. Obviously, an incredible voice in pro wrestling that would make a fantastic politician is is Paul Heyman. Um I don't think there's any doubt about that. And uh, not just saying this, but in terms of new talent who you could really see flipping on the politician button, I got to tell you, L.A. Knight would be a, a perfect. <laughs> I, I believe he's completely capable of, of picking up that mic and, and rallying a base in, in some direction. I'm going to ask him about that after the break. What, what about what about The Rock? I don't like the fact that they keep trying to pester The Rock into running. It's like, dude, I got nine more franchises to make i got 15 more jumanjis to make i got to be doing fast and furious <laughs> well, I, well, hold on, though. roy let's be real the rock who i i love he has a, his own tv show young rock which is by the mm -hmm. way it's maybe the most underrated show on television it is a fantastic sort of traditional family sitcom it's, it's a Correct. wonderful show and i love it because it's all about pro wrestling but he made the backdrop of the show that he was running for president. So he loves to toy with this yeah. idea, I think, for people as well. And with Rocky, you never know whether he's just being a pro wrestler and working everybody, or if he really does have aspirations. Uh, it's, it's really hard to tell. But I think that's what makes him so effective and in a way dangerous because he knows how to charm people. He knows how to engage the voters. Like go watch footage of a politician coming out when they've announced that they're running for whatever the fuck office and compare it to a wrestler coming out the tunnel. Same music, you got some Van Halen. We get higher and higher, straight up. We're and they're just pointing to the fan. People are going ape shit crazy, and the guitar is rocking. He's got a woman on his side kissing him. What, what, what event? Uh, let me ask you this before we go to the break. What event would you say in politics is the WrestleMania of the political world? You know, is it the conventions? I would say that the debates are essentially, you know, the mean gene kind of, which I've also said that there should be more shit talking in politics. I don't like the tactfulness in politics. If you're going to lean into the entertainment factor and the bombasticness that politics is getting into, don't run on a platform. Just blatantly talk shit about your opponents. That's part of why I Trump mean, well, listen, able to get people's opinion. I mean, there, there is a guy who's done that. <laughs> and but nobody did it back. Effect. Nobody clapped no back. back. Nobody clapped back. Especially Clap back at him. Especially the Republicans. You remember how you remember how Jeb Bush got handled? Yeah. I mean, he got tossed around, beat up, nothing. Um, Mark uh, Marco Rubio got destroyed. No comeback whatsoever. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, fi and, and funny enough, ironically enough, it's good old Sleepy Joe who came back. The old man was the only one who sort of stuck back. <laughs> and, and by the way, it worked. It worked. He punched back a little bit. Yeah, it's it's. I would say the final night of the convention, in some ways, is, is like a, a WrestleMania. When I accept right. your nomination for president or whatever. Yeah, but but in some ways, you're right, man. It's hard. 
the last couple of elections, the debates were such must-see TV. I, yo, I for real, I watched the Hillary, I think the final Hillary-Trump debate at a big party at the 4040 Club in New York. Like, it was like a fight. <laughs> like, you were going to a fight. <laughs> so, you're right. It's either the convention or the debate. I One just of think that if politicians were smart, if there's nothing else that they would be able to borrow from the world of wrestling, it's just have energy. I can't tell you shit about Howard Dean's platform, but I can tell you that motherfucker had his dress shirt rolled up and was like, yeah! He looks like, he looks all like, like you. The, he looks like you right now. He looked like a McDonald's district man. He looked <laughs> like the one that come in and check on me and ask me why the deep frying at, at the right temperature. <laughs> <laughs> and, hey. you always, and you remember for the rest of your life <laughs> after the break Peter and I are going to be joined by WWE superstar LA Knight we're going to further discuss how wrestling and politics are more alike than they appear to be and how becoming a pro wrestler can help some politicians get to that next level we need to send all these politicians down to Tampa to whatever the hell the wrestling school is down there they, they the WWE need, Performance Center yeah they need to go down there this is beyond the scenes we'll be right back Beyond the scenes, we're back. Politics, wrestling, how much do they overlap? A lot is what we're discovering so far. Uh, the host of Cheap Heat, Peter Rosenberg, has been posted up with me, but joining us now is someone much stronger than Peter, much more charismatic than Peter. I say all this with respect to you, Peter. I don't want you oh, to think to, uh, By the way, about complete you. respect taken. Yeah, you, you have to respect the, the, the glisten in the background of this gentleman. For those of you listening and not watching, all I see is championship belts just glistening yeah. the camera lens and thank god he wore a nice black leather jacket to dull some of that glisten <laughs> off of. <laughs> you can catch him on friday night smackdown on fox la night welcome to beyond the scenes how you doing brother man i heard you call peter the uh, forever 24 7 champion let's call me the forever million dollar champion future wwe champion yeah let me talk to you you know what see and that, let's just start right there let's start right there with the world of wrestling promos for the people listening and not watching he got all them belts glistening on the wall in the background just every single belt now if you lose a belt do you have to like take that off the wall and unframe it and then like how does that work i i th 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 we'll talk about that later i'll ask you the question i asked rosenberg off the top who was the wrestler that got you into wrestling just as a fan not necessarily as a career choice yet but just when you oh. were eight and nine and jumping off your dad's couch and he going stop dropping off my couch god damn it who were the ones that got you inspired so i was about uh i'm gonna say estimate about three years old and uh i had already been put to bed and i snuck out back behind the couch because wrestling was still on the tv and i needed to see what was happening and I poked my head around, and Nikolai Volkov was talking all kinds of trash on Hulk Hogan. Wow. And I remember he had that Russian hat, and at the time, I'm three, I don't know what he's wearing. It looks like a big burnt marshmallow, and I think I yelled something like, be quiet, marshmallow head. I was a big-time <laughs> Hulkamaniac. I told on myself by accident. My parents were like, what are you doing here? And put me back to bed. But I, yeah, man, I was big-time Hulkamania from day one. Like, how are wrestlers able to come through the television and connect with people? I don't think people really understand just how difficult that is because you're just talking. You're not doing a lot of moving around. Like those interview segments to me are where you fall in love with the wrestler. The performance is one thing, but yeah. it seems like now wrestlers have to be multi multifaceted. Like it's one thing to be athletic and strong. Like we could argue that Andre the Giant did not come through the screen in verbiage. He came through the screen in performance and just being massive. I would make the same argument about The Undertaker. You know, the next gen version of that to me was The Undertaker, who was just, I move in silence, but when you hear that dong, you bitches gonna be scared. Like, in your opinion, like, what is it that holds other wrestlers back from being able to have that gift? Can you learn that gift? Is that something that's taught at the, when you at wrestling college? That's, the, that's how I'm trying to frame it. Old wrestling college. When you at wrestling college uh, down there in Florida, yeah. before you get to the big time, is there a shit talking course? Do you go to it? Do they put you on stage at a black comedy club and go attack the audience? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> learn how to talk shit. Yeah, no, it's 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 funny because a lot of the places you go, they don't do any of that. Like I started old school. You find a wrestling school, and like you learn the moves and stuff like that every maybe three months. 
we'd do a little bit of promo stuff and that was it. Otherwise it was just, you develop your personality on your own. And that's why a lot of the guys, I think just develop moves and never think like that, that isn't that, uh, what I think the, the, the second biggest fear of people in general is death. The first is public speaking. Yep. So for a lot of people, it's a tougher challenge to get in and pick up the microphone than it is to do a backflip or, you know, pick a dude up or whatever. So, um, for me, it was just, that was always the focus. Cause those were the guys that spoke to me. Like you said, it, like, like for me, if a guy couldn't talk, if he wasn't like saying something that caught me, but it's not just the saying the stuff, it's, it's the mannerisms, it's the body language, all that stuff. I wasn't getting that. I just wasn't feeling them the same as the other guys. What are the keys in your opinion to delivering a good promo? You know, and by the way, you're, he's a good person to ask. I mean, this, you are the, you are the best new promo in WWE right now. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, I don't know that I really like, I never thought about it step by step necessarily, but I think it just boils down to believe in what you're saying. Um, and, and there's also like a, there's a charisma, I guess that you asked a second ago, like, can that be learned? And I know there's a bunch of guys who I knew way back who were not good talkers and, and, and just avoided it at all costs. Actually, I'm even going to, I'm going to use uh, Sami Zayn as a great example. He like avoided it. Wasn't a very good talker. Actually didn't want to talk for long. Now he's like one of the best in the business. You put him in front of a microphone in front of a camera and it's, it's electric. The people love him. And so it can be learned if you can unlock that in yourself. But a lot of guys are kind of, I don't know if it's the, there's a block there or what. They can't get in touch with that part. But for me, man, like you, you asked who who started it for me, it was Hogan. But like as it went through, then you discover Flair, you discover Austin Ooh. Rock, uh, oh, yeah. Jake the Snake, uh, Roddy Piper, like all these guys who were just big, verbose, and and everything that they said, you're like, I, they, they believe every word they're saying. And there's not just like a charisma as far as like personality. There's a physical charisma. You said you can't move around much, but like even within that space, there's just body language and there's movement where you're just like, this guy is, he's legit. And that's what I always wanted to do. Macho Man. Macho Man is another one. Rosenberg, do you remember the Macho Man on YouTube? I know if you type in Macho Man, sugar is sweet. And mm -hmm. so it's the cream rises to the top. And yes, Macho I Man. The top is, is, is a big one, yeah the way he would just enter the frame. Macho Man's thing was he would very rarely be in frame when Mean Gene started the top of the promo. Yeah, he, More, he like, ran it a lot, yeah. Yeah, normally it's a two shot and he just goes, okay, motherfucker, what do you have to say about the fight? Macho Man would come in the frame, not even face the camera, sometimes not even face Mean Gene. Oh, but just, just throw away, just, Macho Man, you talk about WrestleMania. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, you thought so, but I know so. It's like, why are you attacking Mean Gene? <laughs> Just what are you doing <laughs> but it was so great. I, I, f I feel like some of the key elements, and Rosenberg, you chime in if you have some, some ideas, but I feel like some of the key elements are the tempo in which you speak and the octaves. Like you talk about Ric Flair. Ric Flair was up here. But then when he would get into specificity, I think detail is a very important thing that is overlooked when we're talking about painting a picture. Like we're just talking about like on some human connection shit. Like when Hogan goes, these 34 inch Python, however wide his bicep was, he would get into that level of specificity about things that I think also would help. And I don't think politicians do that because politicians are so worried about saying the wrong thing. And they've got some nerdy nerd tech person right off camera going, OK, that speech will get 14 more likes than the last quote that you gave that scaled well. You need to make sure that the voters know that you can. Whereas L.A., I'm assuming that you just know what your character is. You know what the objective is. And from there on, it's just a little bit of improv and a little bit of who you already are as a person, one, and two, as a character, but how much thought goes into the words before they come out your mouth versus, I would say, a politician? Okay, so I've been doing this a very long time, but even before WWE. And so one of the big things I can remember saying at least a good 60 to 70% of the time before I walk through the curtain is, I don't know what I'm about to say when I go out there, but we're about to find out. And it's because I have a roadmap. I know where I'm going. I know how I'm gonna start. I know how I'm gonna finish, but in the middle, we're going to weave a road and we're going to figure out where we go. And hopefully it's, 
<laughs> Hopefully it gets us where we need to go. Usually it does. Um, WWE is slightly more structured, but at the same time, it's like I, I do have the freedom to again, where it's like, it's, it's, I know where I'm going. Maybe there's a key point or two, but otherwise, hey, we'll see what we get when I come back. You also, you tapped into something there, Roy, that I thought was super interesting. I haven't heard expressed like that. And I think it makes a lot of sense, which is the cadence, tempo, and the voice changes. Because when, when you think about the best, the, my favorites, L, L.A. mentioned before, Jake the Snake is a guy who would stay so low and then get up and get big when he needed to, but then come right back down. Savage Savage did that brilliantly. Flair did it as well. And the only sort of political comp, because I think you're right, most politicians don't do that because their thought is, I want to seem even. I want to seem measured. But when I think of the greatest orator of the of the modern era uh, in, in a way, not, not exactly a politician, but a similar sort of energy, I think of Dr. King. Dr. King was a master in his speeches and yeah. keeping you, I'm going to tell you a story, we're going to stay low, and then we're going to go, and he gets get you all the way back up. He, he allowed his emotions to dictate, and I mean, let's be honest, he is probably the most effective public communicator of the 20th century, you know, and I, it is interesting that he shared that quality. That's the key word, effective. I was just going to say, if you're going to be an effective speaker, you can't be at one level the whole time. There's different levels that you got to take people. You got to bring them down to bring them up. If you're just up the whole time, where do you go? If you're down the whole time, okay, well, that was nice, but never got us anywhere. It's like having a setup to a joke and no punchline or just telling all punchline and no setup. Like you have to have yeah. the, whole, the whole piece of the equation. It's like when you hear a lot of politicians speak at big rallies, especially when it's a big crowd, they all fall into the John F. Kennedy cadence and tempo school of public speaking. And we, America, will not stand for that. And I'm like, if you're listening to the words acoustically, they're all playing the same song, same BPM. It's the same y'all are all right. It's like a genre of music almost where everybody has essentially the same producer. LA, when did you feel a change in your career where you feel like the fans were starting to connect with you? And was there something different or anything different that you feel like you were doing performatively that got you to that place? Like, oh, I need to do a little bit more of that. And then more fans will love me. You know, I, I'd say it was probably, this was early on in my career, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, and I was living in LA, just working little local promotions and whatnot. It was just like, I felt a freedom that I didn't feel when I started in Ohio. Ohio, I just felt like everybody was like breathing down my neck and they were they'd criticized for this, that, whatever. And, and, and that's fine, sometimes you need that stuff. But when I got to LA, there just felt like a freedom of just like, all right, I can do my thing. These people like respect the fact that I've like traveled around, I've done different things and whatnot. And so having that uh, weight off my back, I guess, gave me the ability to be a little more free. It was just kind of like going out there and just letting me be me. And uh, I've always said that, like, my, I, I'm basically like when I'm out there, it's the argumentative and the party version of myself. So I'm super turned up, but at the same time, I'm ready to, you know, tell you some shit. Oh, can I say that? I don't know. Oh, yeah, um, you can and... say whatever the fuck you want. We on the internet, man. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right. So, uh, <laughs> but... So it, it's just like, I'm ready to fire up when I'm out there. But at the same time, again, you gotta be measured while you're out there. So I don't know that I can pinpoint anything particular, but there was like, I'm gonna say probably late 2011, I just had a mind shift, like like a mindset shift where it was like, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of letting things come to me. I need to go and start knocking some doors, uh, knocking some doors down and, and make opportunities happen rather than just, oh, you know, sometime, at some point somebody will find me and discover Let's flip it real quick, Peter. What are some skills that politicians have that could serve wrestlers well in the WWE? Like, there's a lot that wrestlers do that politicians could be doing. Is there anything that wrestlers could, could learn from politicians? I, I think uh, I would put it like this. Uh, serving your base. Knowing who your base is oh. and, and giving them what they want. I mean, I, I'm sure Ellie could speak to this more, but Sometimes, you know, as people or guys and girls are figuring out what their character is over years, I feel like they end up trying to do things that are just not them. And I understand you want to 
push boundaries. And listen, I'm sure there are times politicians are like, you know, I don't know how I feel about this issue. And who am I talking to? Roy, you know, it, every, every politician does it all the time. I don't really believe in this, but this is what the base wants. And I am going to please the people who already <laughs> mess with me instead of trying to win over people I'm not going to get. And I think sometimes wrestlers can learn from the same thing. If you know that you are great at, you know, I'll hear the, um, I'll hear the veterans talking all the time. Booker T, who I have, who shirt I happen to be wearing right now, but loves to point this out. Uh, we'll be we'll be watching the show after the kickoff show, and we'll see a, a big wrestler, a physically really large, you know, impressive guy, try to do these aerial moves that just don't benefit him or the person that they're wrestling. And book, you know, Booker's like, God damn, what the hell? Why he's acting like he's five seven? He's six foot eight. You know, like, you're not <laughs> pleasing the fans and what the fans want from you. And, Ellie, I'm sure you know, like, a lot of guys are like, yeah, but I want to show that I can do more. But sometimes right. that's for your ego and not for the audience that's watching. You just look corny trying to. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, you you got to save that stuff for the right spots. But but I, I would add an addendum to what you're saying is, is you want to appeal to your base, but you also want to, just like politicians, you want to bring in the new voters. Right. You want to bring in the new eyes and the audience. And, and so... But I don't think, as to what you're saying, you need to do some ridiculous shit like that, where it's just like, I can I can do me and be true to what I'm doing and what my character would do and all that stuff and still hopefully connect enough to bring in people who aren't ordinarily there and be like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of interested in what this guy's doing. Right. But do, but do y'all think, though, you know, and I don't know how wrestling is after a match or the week after where you do, like... Um, a performance review or you talk with the producers and they go, okay, here's where we would have liked to done better or worse or whatever. But I know yeah. politicians have a bunch of people in their ear telling them right down to what color fucking tie to wear for this particular event. Oh, well, today you're talking to steel workers, so we're just going to go with a sweater instead of a blazer. You, we need you to look more like how important is public perception for politicians? And should they just start letting go of that? This idea that, oh, I'm good and I need to be a regular person because regular people are voting for me. Can they start letting go of that a little bit and start listening to themselves instead of listening to all of these people who are trying to do political science and in, in motion? Oh my, my God, after the last two election cycles, hell yeah. I think uh, I think that whole apple cart's been upset at this point. I mean, I, I heard you guys talking before I got in here about, uh, you know, how the politicians try to be just like you, but it's like they do, but like they don't like they're almost they tried to be too clean for so long, like perfect. Like I, I do no wrong. And then the second, you know, somebody does the slight of hell that Howard Dean went Pow! and that was enough to get his yeah. ass out. Like, like that was that was it. So like the littlest thing would get people out. Whereas now it's like since 2016, it's like you can say anything. And as long as you just own it, it seems like you're good. But if you cower to it, then it's like, well, man. all right, well, I'm out of here. Um, so it, it's in a strange way, it's beneficial that they're not doing it. But at the same time, it's come out in a really poisonous way where it's now just everybody is gloves off saying ridiculous stuff. Uh, so you don't know what's what. Yeah, like I really feel like the shame monster has already proven that it won't bite if you look it in the eye. And I think yeah. that the good politicians have realized that, oh, the shame monster's coming. Gotta run, gotta run. It's like, no, what's up? Yeah, I did it. Yeah, I got eight babies on the way. Anyway, vote for me. You gonna vote for me or not? <laughs> There's nothing people well, can say. I can remember like 10 years ago just being like, you know, like these politicians are so clean. If somebody just came out and they were, they were themselves, they'd probably win. And I didn't expect it to go quite how it did, but, but technically I was right. What happened. Guy stole yeah. my gimmick. Yeah, he just said, yeah, I, he took pictures with McDonald's. Like, he didn't need to go to a school and read to elementary kids. Look at me, I'm eating Big no. Macs on a private jet. You know what? Yeah. I want to be that. Because what American wouldn't want to be on a private jet with fucking McDonald's? Right. That is the and that's what, that's what wrestling, I think, when you asked earlier about, you know, what was it about wrestling that got me? I really, I'm a very... I, I, I certainly wouldn't say I'm non-combative because I am verbally combative, but I am certainly non-violent. I have no interest in any violence in any way. And the toughness of certain superstars, the fact that they could really... I mean, I had a period in my life when I was an adult and I would still, before something big, like a big meeting, 
I swear to God, I would literally be blasting Triple H's theme in the car. To like, I'm picturing Triple H blowing the water, <laughs> spitting the water up in the air. Like who? Like who? That Triple H, when he comes out, and spits that water up in the air. That dude's not scared of anything on earth. And I do think that's a real appeal of superstars. I get it. That song's a jam. I listen to it in the gym. I, yeah, I feel the same way. I start spit, gym mix. I'm spitting water on the floor. It's, it's a wild scene. <laughs> to that point about Shane, Brother Knight, what do you do? when you make a mistake, you know, in the ring or at an event, like as a as a wrestler, like how do wrestlers recover from botches or mistakes on the mic in the ring? Like Peter, you're talking about Booker T. We've all seen the hilarious video of him <laughs> kind of sorta almost saying the N word because yeah. he got so riled up. <laughs> like that's how black <laughs> people talk. I'm coming that wasn't for you. Sort of. He hit that. He definitely hit it. Definitely <laughs> hit it. <laughs> I'm coming for you, Negro. Like he said, and then you can see on his face, like the oh shit, I shouldn't have said <laughs> that. How do you recover as a wrestler, and what tips would you give to politicians who might be making gaffes on the campaign trail? It, it depends. You know, I, I I like to say that I've never made any mistakes, but that'd be a damn lie. Uh, but you just you you got to look like you did them on purpose. I. Uh, there was one I did back in like 2017 where I was trying to do some double bounce thing, totally botched it. But when I landed, I just kind of looked at the audience like I meant to do that. And they just kind of showered <laughs> me with, you know, booze and all that stuff. And now, <laughs> Peter, on the radio side, the, the time that I was in radio in Birmingham, a much different market from New York City in terms of the immediacy of reaction to saying the wrong thing on the air. When you, because when you're talking for four hours straight, you can't script that. And sooner or later, some shit gonna come out your mouth that maybe you should have thought about for a couple of extra songs before you said it. Knocking on the wood as you said that, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Is it a matter of waiting until you see if there's outrage and then you own it? Or do you just own the gaff immediately? And like, which road do you think politicians should kind of deal with? I'm a big apologizer. I admit that. And I didn't used to be as much. And then I had a few situations because thank God, knock on wood, I've never had anything crazy. I, I'm, I'm, well, I like to believe I'm just a good person. So nothing that insane is going to come out of my mouth. Now, context is everything. We were to go back to the way my show with Cypher Sounds was promoted 10 years ago, where we were really leaning into race stuff all the time. I've heard things we did that I'm like, that would not go today. Um, and that that goes for all of us, everyone on the show. Our whole vernacular to me now sounds scary. That to goes, hear. to be fair, that goes for urban radio as a genre. Oh, yeah. Every, and it wasn't just... 95 to about Trayvon Martin. Yeah, exactly. It, everything was a, little, was a little different. But for what those times were, I knew I was good at watching what the line was. Like, I understood and didn't cross. And now there's lo- the line has changed, and I try to push myself with the line. I'm not going to fight back against that. So, like, even when I have something silly come up, like uh, a few months ago, I got dragged for about three or four days because in an interview with um, Kelly Rowland, I compared her to Beyonce. I basically was like, what's it like? Being sort of, you know, second to Beyonce. I didn't frame it exactly like that, but it was close. The rough was- question. Yeah, it was it was clumsy. It, it did not. It's not my favorite question of all time. But at yeah. the same time, you know, if I was talking to L.A. Knight and he was in the middle of a a, a storyline with The Undertaker, and I'm like, so what's it like being that close to The Undertaker? I imagine he'd be like, I get your question. He's one of the greatest of all time. The point is, I got dragged for saying that. It was a it was a three day never ending beatdown on the grounds that you minimize Kelly Rowland as a solo Correct. artist and everything that she's done post Destiny's Child. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, and then, of course, there was extra racial components thrown into it and just like different things, all of which a lot, of course, a lot of me is going, this is absurd. This is an absolute ridiculous Internet conversation to have. But my response was just, I'm sorry. Like, if, if I really I said, hey, it was a clumsy question. I meant no disrespect by it. And I realized people are upset. I didn't hit you with the if I'm offended, I'm sorry. I just said, I'm sorry. Like. People are upset. I'm sorry. I I, I should have done better. What sucks, though, is that there's a serious lack of nuance and then even looking at your energy in the interview leading up to that question. Even if the question was clumsy, if the intention was genuine, we kind of got to give people a foul tip. And I think we also live in a society now where everybody's already on strike, too. 
you're on strike two when you leave the house with society. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that's part of the issue as well. But after the break, we're going to bring this conversation home and take a look at famous wrestling matches and rivalries. Also, we need to talk a little bit about the music that is attached to creating the persona and what politicians could learn about that. Because we need to talk about these musicians who be like, hey, man, don't you come out to my shit no more. I saw what you did at the rally last night, though. <laughs> don't use <laughs> this yeah. is Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. Beyond the Scenes, we're rounding third and headed for home. We're talking about wrestling and politics and how they overlap. Before we get into one or two other questions I had about the comparisons and you know similarities and differences between these two worlds. WrestleMania is this weekend. So let's just get into it your favorite WrestleMania moment. Peter, I want to start with you because I got a two-parter for LA Night. But Peter, what's your favorite WrestleMania moment? I feel like we already kind of talked about it with Andre the Giant, but do you have any others? Yeah, of course. That, that WrestleMania three will forever be my WrestleMania. It, I don't think anything could ever surpass it. Uh, Hogan slamming Andre and then the match between Steamboat and Savage. That's probably the, the biggest one. But then I'd say uh, you go way later, um, to Toronto, Ontario, uh, WrestleMania 18. That moment when Hulk Hogan and The Rock are just staring at each other and the crowd, A, Canada may have the best wrestling fans in all the world, and and B, the fact that you get this, this is what makes wrestling the best. This is why wrestling crushes, quote, legit sports. You're never getting Muhammad Ali versus Mike Tyson. It's just never, it cannot happen. Mm but you got to see like the faces of two generations. That's a great analogy. Like face off against each other and and to watch the crowd and then to see it, you know, and LA, I'm sure this stands out in your mind too. The crowd completely turned around in the match and ended up cheering for Hulk Hogan who had been a bad guy to that point, but the nostalgia hit them so hard that they said, <laughs> no, no, I gotta root for Hulk Hogan. That to me is just an epic. What do you think modern day? That's an epic moment. I'm just gonna see myself out because he just stole my thunder. So no, I mean I was gonna say uh WrestleMania 18 as well for the exact same reasons, the exact same things, because I mean you for me personally, you're talking about one of my childhood favorite well, definitely my childhood favorite and one of my like teenage favorites. Like between like my Mount Rushmore is Hogan Rock. Austin Flair. And Ooh. so now you got two of those four in a match. And it was, a, I mean, again, like he said, that crowd was insane. They stood there and had a face off for probably a good solid two, three minutes. And the place just is erupting and they're doing nothing. And uh, the first time that like Hogan like shrugs him off on the, on the lockup. And it's just, you're seeing the people out in the crowd. Like we had, there was one guy I remember like doing this and they catch the <laughs> shot of him doing it and everything. And it's, it's so crazy that you're like, man, I wish I was there. So that's a hundred percent like one of the top ones that that really, really cemented like, shit, I think I'm gonna do this. And that was exactly a year before one to the day, one year before I started wrestling training. Wow. What is it like? What is the energy of that event in person like? And what does that mean like for you? and your journey like the only thing i can compare it to in stand-up comedy is the apollo theater because there's such history within that building and what it takes to get on that stage blah 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 like i know what that was like but i know even that doesn't just to start at wrestling college i don't know why i keep calling it college but you know what i mean i like it i'm gonna start calling it that from now on when you started at the florida institute of wrestling (laughs) (laughs) to go from there so highbrow you know (laughs) splitting a panda express meal with one of your with one of your buddies to go from there to being in that building what was that like and what did that mean to you royal rumble is my closest so far you're talking in the alamo dome with you know about fifty thousand people or whatever it was it felt like mania it it felt like mania out there it did very much so and 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 i mean you're talking about and you know everybody's got their own struggles and story and stuff but i mean a guy who's slept in my car a guy who's you know slept on friends floors for months at a time and stuff like that just trying to make this whole thing happen over a long period of time and to finally come to a moment like that that is crazy it's it's like humbling in a way but it also makes me look back at that process like 
shit, it was all worth it. And in a way, like almost I can look back at that in like a weird, like endearing way where it's like, I can almost be like, man, those were damn good times, even though they were really shitty times. <laughs> what will you all say in the wrestling world? Are, are there any political comparisons to like, like give me a famous political feud or rivalry that you think remind you of a famous wrestling feud? Mm, like, I, I don't, I don't know if I can be specific, but I would just say like the Democrats and the Republicans themselves are like WWE and WCW. It's like you've oh. got really, you've got passionate fans who want to choose a side, but then there's like a big swath in the middle who like they might lean one way or the other, but they're still switching channels back and forth because they're they're at least kind of interested in what the other one's doing. And so like that reminds me so much of just like the two political parties just in general. And also, you know, wrestling is interesting in that it also has all of these other outlets, which would essentially parallel independent and third party voting where people go, no, I don't like either one of those. Yeah. I kind of like what's going on over here. How much yep. thought do you put into the music that you choose and how that moves the audience and how that helps to build your persona? I'm probably an annoyance in that uh, in that field because I'm like super on top of that. Um, uh <laughs> I made my own music when I was uh, in the independence uh, because I always knew that there was a specific sound that I wanted. How can I do this? Okay, I like this song, but I wanted a couple beats per minute faster. Uh, I used to be a drummer, so like, you know, I, I can figure out how to make a beat or you know get a piano and create some loops and stuff, which I did back in 2018. So it's like I'm I'm on top of stuff. And WWE, they create it, but I had some input. Like, hey, look, this is what I want. This, this, that. They gave me one, and I'm like, hey, can we bring the drums up a little bit? Um, cause you want, like, you can make an awesome song that's great for a video package, but video package music ain't going to be the same as music where I'm walking into a room about to fight somebody and, you know, kick somebody's ass. I need some hard hidden stuff when I'm walking out there that just gets me into a zone. Um, and really that depends on what you're doing. The Undertaker, for instance, you know, we mentioned him earlier, he's coming out to basically funeral music. So that's a whole other different vibe. <laughs> so it's it, it, what, what fits. Yeah. I mean, uh, and think about it. Has there ever been a a, a better ver a better case of like actually your theme song in wrestling being political than Hulk Hogan having Real American? I mean, that that's oh, wow. that is not unintentional. I mean, he by the way, he took that theme song it was being used previously before that, and then they said, you know what? Let's give this to, to Hulk Hogan. And that Real American, wow. that leaning into the patriotism, that's a that's a big part of Hogan's character. And I thought it was really fascinating and funny um, and in impactful in some way. Granted, I chuckled when I would hear it, but now whenever I um, hear the proud to be an American, whenever I, I think Trump <laughs> and like you watch it and you're like, really? did, yeah, he, every rally. And you know, they'd be waiting for him for like 10 minutes. It would just be playing over and over again. And, and I'll just, that was a, I, I just that was, think YMCA. <laughs> that's that's the, that's the theme song but, right? Right, well no but the, the, it's 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 so funny because like that song obviously he is so not a typical like proud american he's this business tycoon from new york who the people who he's speaking to should hate everything about him but he throws on proud to be an american and it sets a this it's a banger and, and clinton had um <laughs> Don't stop thinking about tomorrow, which was like so perfect. Yeah. His character was, you know. Weren't they also doing uh, Van Halen right now? Or am I am I imagining that? Or was I don't that know. maybe I'm just that. Maybe I'm just thinking of Crystal Pepsi. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all all important things from that time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, they could stand to learn from wrestlers because there are some wrestlers, man, who I love, and I realized later a lot of it was their theme song. I'm like. <laughs> 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 He if just came entrance, out to the ring good. really nice, but it was that's, kind that's of it. Go, if you have a great man. entrance, that's a big piece. You hear that banger, you're like, yes! The Love this starts, guy, like, I think. Oh, all right, okay. All right, well, I'll get you all out of here on this. This, this is, we'll just call this a rapid, a rapid answer question here. Uh, out there in California, former actor Ben Savage is running for, I think, Senate, or is it House? Oh, yeah, Boy, Boy Meets World, right? Yeah. What's a better transference of skill sets? Celebrity turned politician or mm. celebrity turned wrestler? 
Ooh. man, that's tough. I, I think politician, just because it, it depends on the celebrity, though. If you're talking like a sports celebrity or something, now they've already got like an athletic background, something like that. Because um, a lot of times when we brought in, you know, sports figures, they're able to pick it up a little bit just because of, again, that, that athletic background. But Yeah, Rodman did a couple stints. Yeah, but I mean, like, it's t- if somebody's not used to getting beaten up and banged up, it, it can be a real reality check. So I almost feel like being a celebrity going into politics, that's that's a lot, maybe not easier necessarily, but probably a better fit just because now it's like, okay, well, I can use this charisma or this status or whatever that I used before to get this going to now appeal to these people. They know my face. I'm familiar. I'll, I'll make LA's a point for him. I work for WWE. They will never use me in a wrestling match ever in history. It will never happen. <laughs> you're not gonna. You're not gonna be the next Jonathan Coachman to come out the booth. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get in a, I mean, I, I'm. A, I am a former 24/7 champion, but I'm not gonna get invited to be in the Royal Rumble. However, if I were to say like I'm running against Eric Adams in the next New York mayoral race, I'm not saying I'd win. But having being known in New York for that long, I could at least get myself into the conversation. Yeah. I have no chance at wrestling. There's the, the the ability that it takes is impossible. And to Ellie's point, that's why you can have a Pat McAfee show up and be effective and good. You can have Logan Paul show up and get a WrestleMania match because these guys are real athletes who can transfer it. If you don't have it in you, though, I, there's not much you can do. Well, dude, you've done a really good job of leaving a cultural footprint in New York City, and I think you'd be neck and neck with Eric Adams until he pulls out that Kelly Rowland Beyonce tape on your ass. Oh, and then oh boy. A rap. That's all the time we have for today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much to our guest, Peter Rosenberg, LA Knight. Thank you all. Yeah. Hopefully, we've taken you beyond the scenes. Enjoy WrestleMania, boys. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Roy. Good night.